Hi, I'm Catherine and this is Rachel and we're here from Swan Bank Church and um, one of the things we've been doing over the last few weeks during Lent is we've been journeying with this book called The Nail by Stephen Cottrell and a group of us have been meeting early on Wednesday mornings to look at some of the characters who we meet in the Good Friday account of Jesus dying. Um, because we're not able to meet together face to face, we didn't want you to miss out on what we've been doing. And so we're inviting you over the next few Wednesdays to join with us as we continue to journey through this book. And so the character that we're looking at today is a character called Caiaphas. And you can find part of his story in the Bible in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26 verses 57 to 68. So if you've got your Bible with you, you might want to turn to Matthew 26, starting at verse 57, and Rachel's going to read this for us. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus, so that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They, an they answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you?
So as part of this book, uh, we hear a narrative or a monologue from the characters we're looking at. So I'm going to read this to you now, and these are, in a sense, the, the thoughts of Caiaphas. And as I read this to you, just have a think about the story, think about some of the things you're hearing, and maybe try and put yourself into the story. In these situations, it's easy to get it. How can I put it? To get carried away, emotional, transported on a great wave of sympathy, tolerance, but be sure of this, the wave will break and then there is a need for someone to take a longer view, to set this man and this event in a larger context. And that's my task. I am that someone. Facts, you say. What are the facts? Indeed, a very good question. But each witness says something slightly different. So who do you believe? Yes. Their stories were useful, interesting. They create the right impression, concern, alarm, dis-ease. But some of us look behind the facts, to the motive, to the larger picture. So let me put this to you regarding Jesus, the so-called King of the Jews. And for my witness, not the bleating of a few gullible fools who were taken in by his magic and charm, Yes, I'll give you that. He had charm, a certain way with words, but the scripture, God's word, that is what condemns him. For this little preacher from Nazareth, this Galilean Messiah, God above himself. Answer me this, if you will. Which of the prophets ever pointed to themselves? You don't know, do you? Why? Because they didn't. They always pointed to God. Even that imposter John, so proud of his wild ways and dancing about in the margins when it's very easy to win friends and a few favourable reviews. Even he pointed beyond himself. But I act in the centre stage, where decisions have to be made, deals struck. That is my responsibility and I carry it alone. I see that we survive. What good would it be to see this Nazarene tearing up the carefully woven fabric of our equilibrium. Do you think it's easy to survive when these Romans control our every move? They don't care for us and they don't care for peace and they certainly don't care for God, but they do understand order. This Jesus of yours, this Messiah, he pushed it too far. He came in from the margins where we could control him and contain him. Well, let's face it, he had some uses, but like a moth circling too close to the light, it was inevitable once he came to the centre that he would be burned. And if you're as interested in knowing what happened as you maintain, if it is justice you're after, then consider this. His death has maintained order, has kept us going. That is what we need to do. That is what we're skilled at, surviving, adapting. His assault on our order was bound to end like this. So let scripture condemn him, coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, flouting the Sabbath, disturbing the legitimate business of the temple, calling God Father. But more than this, and if you cannot grasp anything else about this case, then take hold of this one fact that reveals his motive. He pointed to himself. He had the audacity to stand in my presence, the high priest of the temple, the one whose role it is to mark out the coming in and going out of God and enter God's presence on behalf of the people and utter the name that even I am not worthy to utter, none of us. You see, that is the point. He dared to say it in my presence, dared to say, I am as if to be with him was to be in the presence of God. And I despise him for it, for striking at the very root of our faith. Destroy this temple in three days. Indeed, it was our very faith, our very survival that he threatened. And so it was better that he died. Justice, blame, 
Don't speak to me about these things when our very existence is at stake. And do not ask for an apology. Did you really believe that the Romans would have suffered him for very much longer? Of course not. We merely hastened the inevitable. We pulled some strings. It was convenient for all of us that we brought things to a conclusion. We nailed it. History will not remember him, but we will go on. You want someone to blame? That's natural. That is, how shall we put it? Reasonable. And if nothing else, I think I've demonstrated that I am a reasonable man. I see things in their context. I do what is right for the survival of our people. I take the longer view. It is reasonable that Jesus died. Better that one man die. Or would you prefer that the whole people perish? There was no other option he had to go. But when it came to his going, well, even his own followers conspired against him. That is the other salient fact. It was all falling apart, all the cracks beginning to show. Those half-witted peasants who followed him, even they couldn't swallow these last blasphemies of his. And the one bright spark among them saw the horror of it, the damage, and did the decent thing. If you want someone to blame for the death of Jesus, then speak of his good companion, Judas. And please, do not think like a tabloid journalist and call him the betrayer. Why? If you care anything for the survival of your people, you will think of him as your saviour. So I'd like to invite you to think around a few questions as you reflect on Caiaphas. I'd like you to think about times when you might have wanted to protect others, times when you have made some difficult decisions because you've seen that to decide something different might have caused difficulties or problems. Think about times when you have felt that you've had to stand against a crowd and how that feels. Or maybe times when you have gone with the crowd when perhaps you should have made a stand. And then think about your own life now, the things you're going through now, the things in your day to day whether it's at work or whether it's at home or whether it's amongst your friends. Is there an area where you really need to make a stand at the moment? When you might need to say something that might make you unpopular? Or you might need to say something that you know others will not agree with? How can you do that in a way that is both, both respectful but also is true to who you are and to what you feel God is calling you to.